everybody, and welcome to uh, OSU Extension Agronomic Props Team's first ever virtual corn college and soybean school. I'm Mary Griffith, an Extension Educator in Madison County, Ohio, and I'm one of the Agronomic Crops team leaders along with Amanda Doritas and Laura Lindsay, and the three of us will be mo uh, moder moderating throughout uh, the day. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. And my topic today is, will ultra early corn work in Ohio? The questions I'm gonna to address today are, what is ultra early corn? Does it have a fit in Ohio? How does it perform compared to commonly grown maturities? A challenge to successful cover crop establishment is the relatively narrow window for planting cover crops after corn harvest in the fall. Planting ultra early hybrids may allow an earlier corn harvest and earlier cover crop seeding and establishment. We've seen cover crop acreage in Ohio increase 100% from 2012 to 2017, from, three, from close to 358,000 acres to 718,000 acres. And interest in using cover crops in corn in corn production systems is increasing. Another reason we're interested in ultra early corns is Late planting, uh, late planting years. Um, 2019 was an example of this, where we had as much as 50% uh, uh, of our corn planted after June 9th that year. And we, in the past two decades, we've seen a lot of uh, extreme weather events in the spring, which have resulted in major delays in planting. So we're interested in ultra early corns to see if they might provide an, an option, be a viable option in late planting years. We can certainly use our commonly grown maturities pretty much through the first week of June, the middle of June for most of Ohio. But once we get beyond middle of June, a lot of growers are interested in shorter hybrids from the standpoint of minimizing risk from frost damage, minimizing dry down problems in the, in the fall. When we plant late, even if we, the crop reaches maturity and if it's very wet, we end up leaving that crop in the field in the fall and that can result in weathering issues like and stock quality and more and kernel quality grain quality issues. And this graph just shows what I would just say, uh, reinforces what we we're just talking about. It just shows the 50% planting date for Ohio from but going back to the 1950s through 2019. Here we're looking at the 50% planting date on the our x-axis, our vertical axis, and then years on our, on our I mean our, our years are on our x-axis and our planting dates are on our y-axis. And you can see that We've seen a definite trend in earlier planting dates, and that's certainly what we recommend. We'd like to see our corn crop in the ground if weather conditions are suitable and soil conditions are, are appropriate. We'd like to get it in the ground in April, but all too often we end up planting much later than that. And in recent years, last I said, last, two, last 20 years, I think got one out of three or one out of four years, we've run into substantial planting delays. So ultra early hybrids, very early corn hybrids, are getting a second look from, from as a as a tool we can use in cropping systems where we're we're short on on growing degree days. Another thing to point out with this graph is it doesn't include replant years. So we've had several replant uh, years where we've had substantial acreage replanted, and those also represent situations where hybrids with maturities different than the ones we are using currently might be an option. And what I'm gonna be talking about today involves hybrid maturity ratings. This is certainly not the focus of what we're talking about, just to have a background in this subject area. I'm gonna be talking mostly about relative maturity and we talk about days to maturity and we're gonna be talking about heat units. And those are the two ones we're gonna focus on. Certainly we're, we're gonna to touch on grain moisture, which is a more definitive assessment of, of hybrid maturity, but from the standpoint of looking at hybrids in the company literature, you're going to be looking at hybrid maturity from the standpoint of days and also heat units. 
So the one that we're going to talk about most today is da the Days to Maturity Rating System. And it's a based on comparison with hybrids of known maturity. And most of you who are working with corn are, are well aware of this, uh, these ratings you see in the in seed company literature describing hybrids. It's the relative difference. It basically involves relative differences within a group of hybrids and usually a group of that company's hybrids for grain moisture at harvest. It's not calendar based. It's useful as a comparative method. And it's usually based on hard planting the corn at, at a typical, at a, at a normal planting window. So we're usually talking about these rating systems being used for making decisions, planting corn at from April to early May. That's what this design, it's basically designed to look at the corn from that standpoint. And it's going to vary. One company's 111-day hybrid might be another company's 110-day hybrid. It might even be another company's 109-day hybrid. They might be very similar genetics or the same genetics marketed by two different companies, and they might have different rating systems. And that may have something to do with the geography of where those companies are marketing those hybrids. The other system I'll talk about just in passing, though, is, is the growing degree day system. And this one is uh, where each hybrid is given a specific number of GDDs indicating the accumulated GDDs to reach maturity or to reach black layer. Usually it's from planting when the seed is put in the ground to when it reaches physiological maturity or the black layer. And one that we use the most in, in the United States is the 8650 cutoff method. And they're basically this straightforward formula. And but that's just to clarify the GDD system we're using. Now, just as a uh, just a passing thought here, just to keep in mind, when you talk about cover crop grasses, they use a, G a growing degree day system also when they're planted in the fall. And they're using a, a GDD system that's the base system would be 90, 39 degrees, not 50. OK, what are ultra early hybrids? Well, commonly grown hybrids in Ohio range from 105 to 114 days. And depending on the seed company, you, they might be some that uh, have hybrids they'd consider commonly grown that it might be one or two days earlier, one or two days less, and same for late, the late end, there might be some that are one or two days more than that. They're approximately 2,500 to 2,800 GDDs. Ultra early hybrids, what I'm, that's the term I'm using for them. You're not gonna see ultra early hybrids typically in any literature. It's just, it's not a scientific term, it's a jargon term, but these are basically the term we're using to describe very early hybrids. These are maturities. These are hybrids that have maturities less than 100 days, typically. And that would be typically less than about 2,400 heat units. So that's when you're, you're dealing with a growing season that would have 2,400 heat units. And these are typically going to be 90 to 100 days, approximately 2,150 to 2,450 GDDs. And I'm, I'm picking 90 to 100 days. You, you know, you could go to 88 days. They're basically hybrids that are earlier than than, uh, than what we currently are using. But for the purposes of the discussion today, I'm kind of arbitrarily using, I'm calling arbitra arbitrarily, I'm calling the ultra early hybrids 90 to 100 day hybrids. And they're going to be variable across the state from the north to south and northwest to northeast. When I, in other words, what one, comp what one geographical area, one extreme geographical area in the state might call an ultra early hybrid, another one might call a normal hybrid. So, for example, if you go up to Ashtabula County, they're actually using 90 to 100 day hybrids and they consider those their commonly grown maturities because of the nature of their growing season. Well, why are we talking about ultra early hybrids? I've kind of hinted at that already, but basically they may offer advantages. They, they mature earlier, they dry down faster. So this is, promotes uh, energy conservation and can save money. Higher prices and premiums for earlier deliveries are possibilities. They allow livestock producers to apply manure earlier and plant cover crops, and that's something we're very interested in. But they also have some potential disadvantages, and I have question marks by each of these because a lot of these disadvantages are based on past perceptions of these hybrids. Certainly in the past, when I've, uh, the years I've worked with corn, uh, going back a number of years, uh, we, didn't, we really didn't give these hybrids a lot of attention. A lot of times they were given kind of a negative, uh, they were referred to kind of negatively. And then and this term, this phrase, 98 days, 98 bushels was kind of a derogatory way of describing these hybrids because they didn't, weren't regarded as having much yield potential. These hybrids were perceived as more vulnerable to heat and drought stress. They were perceived as more susceptible to the diseases and insects and their stock and grain quality was considered marginal. 
Now, corn breeders in the last 20, 30 years have, have made some, made some remar remarkable uh, ad advantage, uh, uh, improvements to corn hybrids across the country, but especially in these short season hybrids. Uh, the performance of these short season corns is, are, is more competitive now today. And even, and even within a zone of adaptation of commonly grown maturities, their uh, short season hybrids are competitive with commonly grown maturities. We have other technical advance, uh, technological advances uh, which have helped these, uh, per, the performance of these short season corns like transgenic insect resistance, which has resulted in a more, uh, provided more uh, crop protection for these early season corns. Just to demonstrate how much of an improvement we've seen in these ultra early corns, or these short season corns, we can look in the Canadian provinces. So for example, they didn't grow much corn in Manitoba, Canada until fairly recently. The temperature up there has warmed considerably, uh, allowing uh, corn to be grown up there. But the corn acreage in Canada has increased nearly 100% from 2015 to 2018. They planted 400, nearly 460,000 acres of corn in 2019, which is really remarkable considering they were virtually growing no corn a couple of years, not that many years ago. And in large part, this is because they're getting very good performance from these very short season corns, the 70 day and 80 day corns. And in some cases they're getting yields as high as 200 bushels, which is just phenomenal considering how short their growing season is. So have those improvements in germplasm, certainly those hybrids that are adapted to that region. We don't want to take to Ohio necessarily, but because they're certainly, they may not be adapted, but nevertheless, there are big improvements in the germplasm that have occurred in recent years. So some of our negative perceptions of these hybrids in the past, we need to take another look at those. These figures just show the relative performance of, of corn hybrid entries in the the relative, I shouldn't say performance, relative maturity of hybrid entries in the, on the Ohio corn performance test. This is from 2018. And basically here we're looking at the figure at the top is from the Northeast, North Central region. The figure at the bottom is the North West region. Each of these regions conduct, we have three locations, retest locations in each one of these regions. The red bars indicate the early test. And those are hybrids that have hybrids that have maturities, relative maturities, of 108 days or less, and the 109 days are full season hybrids. But if you look at the upper bar, you'll see that we only had three hybrids with relative maturities. The, the numbers at the top of each one of those bars indicates the number of entries. And you can see in the Northeast, North Central region, we only had three hybrids that were 100 days or less. And then you go over to the Northwest region and we only had one hybrid. And I was looking at the data from 2020 we don't report relative maturity in our corn performance trial per se. We, of course, we have grain moisture, which is uh, used in, in guiding selections as far as hybrid uh, checking on hybrid maturity. But in the 2020 trials, we only had one entry in the Northeast region was less than 100 days. And that tells you something about, uh, certainly tells you, speaks volumes as to how the companies, seed companies perceive the utility of these the hybrids in, in Ohio. So our, uh, we initiated an assessment of our evaluation of ultra early hybrids uh, back in 2016. What happened was we actually had several seed companies come to the OARDC. They spoke to the farm manager at the OARDC up in Worcester and asked if he would put out some strip tests to evaluate the whether ultra early hybrids, these very short season hybrids, these 90 day hybrids would be suitable in cover cropping systems. In other words, could you plant these ultra early hybrids and perhaps obtain uh, adequate, uh, decent yields and also be able to harvest these crops uh, much earlier and allow uh, cover crop establishment, improved cover crop establishment. Well, we decided in order to get a more uh, accurate assessment of these hybrids to include them in the corn performance trials where the tests would be replicated and we could assess the uh, performance uh, in conjunction with our regular corn, uh, our regular testing program. So we had our objectives were to compare the agronomic performance of ultra early hybrids with commonly grown maturities and to assess the economic returns of ultra early hybrids and commonly grown hybrid maturities. Field trials were conducted in 2016 through 2018, and they were conducted at the two of our Northeast 
test locations at Worcester and Bucyrus. We followed the same protocol that we follow in our corn performance trials, four replications per site in addition. And then we planted these at 34,000 seeds per acre after soybeans. That's our default population in our corn performance test. We evaluated eight brands. To, so we had eight companies came to us and provided entries, uh, hybrids for us to evaluate. And hybrids were the, pretty much the same across, where the, the hybrids were the same across sites each year. And they were pretty much the same hybrids over the three year period at both locations. Now 12 to 16 of these ultra early hybrids were rated 90 to 95 days by the company. So uh, their GDDs varied. Uh, they, so the GDDs range from 2170 to 2430. 19 to 31 of the ultra early hybrids were rated 96 to 100 days with GDDs of 2300 to 2490. And we had a common set of five elite commonly grown maturity hybrids with rated 104 to 109 days with GDDs of 2530 to 2560. Now, what do I mean by elite? These were hybrids that were, had been in our corn performance trial in past years and they had, had, had above average performance we actually were looking at, we were looking for hybrids that would, would provide a high, we wanted to have high yielding hybrids that would be very competitive with the ultra early hybrids. So we, wanted, we didn't want to pick hybrids that were low yielding so that the ultra early hybrids would look good. These were elite hybrids that would be very competitive, have good performance characteristics. Now we planted two sets of, com of the commonly grown maturities. And why did we do that? Well. One set was harvested when we, after we uh, planted these crops and we harvest uh, at, at harvest time, we had one set harvested when the ultra early corn achieved harvest moisture. So we had our ultra early hybrids. We took those crop, that corn off. When it, we were shooting for a, a, a mo harvest moisture about 23 to 24% for those ultra early corns. And we suspected at that time when we harvested the ultra early corns that the commonly grown maturity hybrids might be maybe four or five percentage points, as much as four or five percentage points higher. They might be in the high 20s or maybe even the low 30s. So we wanted to look at one set of the commonly grown maturities when they were harvested very wet, basically, very wet grain. And that, would, that could affect their performance, their, it could affect their yield. So we wanted to also, uh, in order to provide a fair comparison to what commonly grown maturities would actually look like as far as yield and of, of a normal yield, we, we decided to harvest another set of the commonly grown maturities when they achieved harvest moisture. So when they achieved uh, 20, again, shooting for 23 to 24% moisture. And we designated these two different harvest dates, HD1 and HD2. We just did this for the commonly grown maturities. For the ultra early hybrids, we just harvested them at that 23 to 24% range. And we collected the usual, the usual data, the final, final stand, grain yield, test weight, grain moisture, stock lodging. And then we also, if we came across leaf disease, ear rots, any wind damage or something, that was the type of data we would collect if we observed it. Okay, as far as dates of planting and harvest, in these two locations, in 2016 and 2017, we ran into wet conditions, soils were wet, we had persistent rain. So we planted those years, uh, planted uh, in late May and early June. In 2018, we were able to plant in mid-May. And as far as harvest, our harvest dates were typically, in, uh, for the, because of these later plant dates, we were running into mid-October. Mid and then for our second harvest dates for the, what we call the commonly grown maturity hybrids, they were in late October or mid-November, approaching mid-November. And then for the, in 2018, we were looking at our first harvest date in, two, in late September, and then our second harvest date for the commonly grown maturity hybrids in uh, mid-October, mid to late October. The data was analyzed to compare hybrid maturity groups. We had three sets, as we've already mentioned, we had 90 to 95 day hybrids, 96 to 100 day hybrids, 104 to 190 day hybrids, and then we also looked at two sets, the 90 to 100 day hybrids that basically the combined 90 to 95 and 90 to 6 day hybrid, 96 to 100 day hybrids. So we combined that set of ultra early hybrids and then the 104 to 109 day hybrids. 
And then we compared, uh, and the final comparison was then the, compare, the effect of harvest date on the commonly grown hybrid maturity group. These graphs show the relationship of yield to hybrid maturity for the mid-May and the, and the late May, mid-May and then late May to early June plantings. And you can see right off the bat, uh, we had pretty good yields. I'm very, actually right, very surprised right out of how good the yields were for, for the ultra early hybrids. These were certainly not hybrids that were 98 day hybrids by any means. Each one of these points represents basically a plot yield. Increasing relative maturity was associated with greater yields across sites. And yield increase was slightly greater for the mid-May planting dates than the late early June plantings. However, the relationship other, uh, was not strong. You know, there's a lot of scatter here. You can see in both years both for the ultra early hybrids and also for the commonly grown maturities. This is, you know, this is due in part to the wide range in yields among the, these hybrids. And it ranged quite a bit. It ranged in 47 to about 71 bushels. And this tells you something about uh, the importance of hybrid selection. You know, the, these hybrids vary tremendously in yield. And so it indicates as well as the story unfolds later on that Hybrid selection down the road as far as using these hybrids is going to be very important because there's some out there that are very promising and others that are certainly not adapted to Ohio. These graphs show the relationship of hybrid grain moisture to hybrid relative maturity for again for the mid-May and for the late to early June plantings, we've got grain moisture here on our, on our vertical axis and our relative maturities here on our horizontal axis, our x-axis here. And all the, although the, grain, although the uh, grain moisture of the 96 to 100 day hybrids, you can see here, this group right here, don't have them circled, but this, although they were uh, greater than that of the 90 to 95 day hybrids, the difference was pretty small. It was only about a 1% difference between, this, the, between the hybrids that were 90 to 95 day and the 95 to 100 day hybrids. And that has some, some implications as far as hybrid selection for yield later on. Although the trends in graphs yield indicated a, an increase in moisture of about 0.2 to 0.5% per day across all tested hybrids, the differences in the harvest grain moisture levels among the ultra early hybrids was not really consistent with, uh, with maturity ratings. You know, we saw a lot of variability. So some of these hybrids that were rated 104 were not looking that much different than 106 and day hybrids. And this is probably due uh, to the varying relative maturity ratings for hybrids used by different seed companies. You know, what, again, as I mentioned before, one company's 104 day hybrid may be another company's 106 day hybrids, or in the case of these ultra early hybrids, one company's 94 day hybrid may be another company's 106 day hybrid, I mean, 96 day hybrid. So harvest moisture levels of several of these 96 to 100 day hybrids were actually comparable or lower than the 90 to 95 day hybrids. Well, what about the economic assessment? Returns per acre uh, were calculated using a corn price of 350 a bushel. It's not the price we're seeing today, but that was the price that was typical price that we were seeing during the course of the study. The drying, co drying cost of three cents Per, for each percentage point above 15.5% uh, moisture was used. We had an adjustment for test weight, a two cent premium for test weights greater than or equal to 58 pounds per bushel, and a three cent deduction per point below 53 pounds per bushel. Okay, finally, let's take a look at the yield data here, performance data. And this is data for the mid-May planting. Here we're looking at grain yield, moisture, test weight, and returns for the first harvest date. We've got the hybrid maturity here. We're looking at the 95, 90 to 95 day hybrids, the 96 to 100 day hybrids, 104 to 109 day hybrids, and then 90 to 100 day hybrids. Comparisons between these different maturity groups here. And then 
what we're especially interested, the bottom line here, that kind of in the yellow bar here, the ultra early hybrids, the 90 to 100 day hybrids versus the commonly grown maturities, and for yield, grain moisture, test weight, and return in dollars per acre. So for the mid-May planting, the ultra early hybrids, the 90 to 100 day hybrids yielded about 10% less than the commonly grown maturity. So 200, 253 bushels versus 229 bushels. The 90 to 95 day hybrids and the 96 to 100 day hybrids yielded 12 and 9% less respectively than the commonly grown maturities. 231, 224 versus 253. The grain moistures of the ultra early hybrids averaged 18.4% versus 21.2% for the commonly grown maturities. The test weights of the ultra early hybrids was 5% greater, about 2.5 pounds per bushel greater than the commonly grown maturity hybrids. Here's test weight. And returns dollars per acre were greater for the 104, 109 day hybrids are commonly grown maturities, 63, 64, about $64. So we're making more $64, uh, 60, about $64 more with the commonly grown maturity hybrids. And you can see how that broke down though between the 95 day, the 90 to 95 day hybrids, we were seeing about a $77 difference for the 96 to 100 day hybrids, about a $56 difference. So this is for the mid planting dates. Now let's take a look at the, the grain yield, moisture, test weight, and returns for the first harvest date for the late May, early June plantings. Again, this is range, this table is range very similar to the last one. We've got the different mature, we've got the maturity groups and the maturity group comparisons and the yellow bar is the comparison between the ultra early and the commonly grown maturity hybrids. So for the late May to early June planting, the ultra early hybrids, the night, these 90 to 100 day hybrids yielded, averaged uh, about 9% less than the commonly grown maturity hybrids, about 22 bushels less. The 90 to 95 and the 96 to 100 day hybrids averaged about 13% and 8% less respectively than the commonly grown maturity hybrids. About 29, $19 difference from here, the 96, day, 96 to 100 day hybrids. Difference is not as great as that with the 90 to 95 day hybrids. Grain moisture uh, averaged uh, at about 18.5% for the commonly grown maturity hybrids um, versus 24.2. Again, we were shooting for we were shooting for moisture levels that were higher than what we achieved. We, we certainly would have thought we would have seen bigger, wider differences had we done that. The grain test weight was 7% or three three and a half pounds greater for the commonly grown maturity hybrids. Now, while yield was greater, you know, while yields were greater for the 104 to 108, 109 day hybrids planted in at this time in this early, this uh, late May and early June planting date, the returns per acre for the 96 to 100 day hybrids, they were $750, were not uh, from, a, from, from a statistical standpoint, were not, we did not did detect any significant differences. So they were not different from the 104 to 109 day hybrids. And this is due to the, uh, low test weights and high har harvest moistures, the discounts from the low test weights that we used and the high, high harvest moisture associated with the commonly grown hybrid maturities. So we didn't see for the 96 to 100 day comparison versus the 104 to 109 day hybrids, we didn't see a significant difference. Now that's $20 difference you see, and that's uh, from, from a statistical standpoint, we didn't see that we didn't consider that significant. And certainly if we'd been looking at higher grain moistures that probably uh, we would have probably widened these some of these differences and we've sort of seen greater discounts and greater advantages from the standpoint of grain moisture. Okay now let's look at the grain moisture for the grain yields moisture test weight and return for the commonly grown maturities. These were the 104 to 109 day hybrids the harvest dates on, on harvest dates one and two 
for the mid-May planting dates. And here we're looking at harvest dates of late September and early October and for yield, grain moisture test weight, and then the returns. And you can see on the lid uh, for late May versus late October, there was a slight difference. So tr we saw trends towards higher, uh, higher yields with later planting dates, but we didn't see a significant difference as far as yield. Grain moisture, of course, was uh, uh, lower for the late October harvest and test weights were higher for the late October harvest. And as a result, we saw, well, we would have, uh, we saw the differences probably uh, for these were, were, were not enough to make them significantly different on these different harvest dates. But even though there were some, there were, these were significant costs. So we went from 843 to 883, but again, from a significant standpoint, we didn't see anything there. Now with the late May, early June plantings, again, range very similarly to the last one, We're looking at, um, as far as arrangement here, looking at mid-October versus late October, these harvest dates. Yields did not differ between the early and normal harvest dates for the commonly grown maturities. However, the returns were reduced 11% on the earlier harvest date due to discounts from low test weights and high harvest moisture. So here we did see a significant difference when we, when we looked across these harvest dates because of the nature of the, the higher, much higher grain moisture, which was 8.4% and the test weight, which was 4.7%. 4.7% higher test weight and much significantly drier corn, which resulted in a significant difference from the standpoint of dollars per acre. So what are the implications of this for cover crop establishment? Well, here in this uh, figure shows the environmental conditions between harvest dates for the commonly grown maturities. Remember on each, so we're looking here at these 2017-2018, um, our harvest date range, which was anywhere from two to three weeks. And it shows that our accumulated GDDs during this period of time, during this interval and the precipitation and days with, uh, that we have rainfall of, of exceeding a quarter of an inch and these test results suggest that growers would gain delay, gain days for potential crop establishment and growth by planting ultra-early hybrids. The earlier harvests afforded by planting ultra-early corns provided, would provide 210 to 447 more GDDs and point, about 0.7 to maybe a little over four inches more rainfall, potential rainfall. than would have been available following the following harvest of the commonly grown maturities at typical harvest days and typical harvest moistures. So growers seeking to ensure, uh, growers seeking to ensure successful cover crop establishment, you know, may be willing to consent, may be willing to harvest these ultra early corns at moisture levels higher than those used in this study. You know, one of our years, we, we were down to about 22%, another one 24%. I have a suspicion that some of these growers, in order to get their cover crop established, might be willing to look at the uh, harvesting their, their ultra early corns at 25% moisture or even higher. And that would certainly make the, them much more competitive with commonly grown maturity hybrids. So if they did that, returns per acre for the ultra early hybrids relative to commonly grown maturity hybrids would increase. So in summary, the hybrid evaluations will play a key role in selecting high yielding ultra early hybrids given the variability in yields evident in these tests. Uh, it's, it's gonna be very important though for, to, for a grower who's interested in looking at these ultra early hybrids to work closely with a seed company rep representatives or agronomists on the best adapted ultra early hybrids. And many, remember, some of these are coming out of Wisconsin and Michigan. They're not commonly grown in Ohio. Some are, there's a, the database is gonna vary with these companies as far as what they have available on information, but it's, this is going to be very important in making an assessment of what to use. But there are, and it's not likely you're going to see seed companies entering these ultra early hybrids in our corn performance test. As you saw earlier, they only had one or two. We only had one this past year. Uh, and so they're not going to enter these on a regular basis. But it's important to keep in mind that these there are ultra early hybrids that have produced yields that are comparable to the commonly grown maturity hybrids. They certainly hybrids in our, our regular corn performance tests that uh, they were adjacent to our, our these ultra early hybrids and some of these uh, hybrids in our commonly grown maturity tests were not yielding as well as some of the top yielding ultra early hybrids. 
Earlier maturity hybrids may uh, incur um, less drying costs and have a higher test weights, but as but the uh, but they have yielded disadvantages as, as a group compared to 104 109 day hybrids. They're exceptions, but they're as a group they they still have a yield disadvantages. After factoring in drying costs, the economic return of the 96 to 100 day ultra early hybrids was comparable to the comp commonly grown maturity hybrids when planted in late May and early June and harvested on earlier harvest days. So there are these, exception, these exceptions. Now, one thing we were very interested in was to get a feel for how these ultra early hybrids would, uh, what they would look like from the standpoint of their resistance to stock lodging as, and also to various disease problems, ear rots, stock rots, leaf diseases. And unfortunately, I shouldn't say that, but we had good years and we had good yields, but we did not see pr disease pressure. We didn't see a lot of stock lodging. We saw negligible stock lodging, negligible disease pressure, even though ear rots and, and stock rots were evident at some of our locations in these years at other test locations, and they weren't at these locations. So we need more information. We only have five site years on Northeast Ohio for this information. More performance data is, is definitely gonna be needed. And finally, the greater economic returns of the commonly grown maturity hybrids was reduced when they were harvested early at gray moisture levels exceeding 24%. And when considering changes to relative maturity for late planting, this may help in the decision-making process. Early, earlier harvest resulted in substantial gains in GDDs and precipitation, which would likely improve cover crop establishment and the benefits gained from this practice. And we did get, we got funding for this work from the, uh, the Conservation Tillage and Technology Conference, a mini grant from that group. And uh, for more information, if you're interested in more information about the performance of ultra early hybrids, short season corns, check out OSU fact sheet ANR94, short season corn versus commonly grown corn hybrids for planting in Ohio. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions in the Q&A for you. Um, so uh, the first question is data on specific ultra early hybrids available. Is that, um, would that information be in the fact sheet that you just showed? Um, we don't, we don't, in the fact sheet, we don't, uh, Mary, is data available on the specific hybrids we tested? No, it is not. It's not in our fact sheet. We could probably make it available if a grower is interested in, but the only problem is that these, are, because it was two, 2016 to 2018, uh, we were actually having a problem in 2017 and 2018, making sure we got all the hybrids in there, because as you know, and many of our, and many of you know out there that uh, these hybrids turn over a lot. Uh, from the standpoint of the availability. That's not to say there aren't hybrids very similar to some of these, but if you were interested, we could certainly see if we could find uh, uh, a spreadsheet with some of that information to provide it, but it's not provided in the fact sheet. Okay. Um, next question. If you selected for the top 25% based on yield um, or some other percentage, based on yield in each group, would analysis be much different? You're comparing random early hybrids to what was considered elite hybrids in the later group. So if I'm understanding, your, yeah, the question is, if we looked at the top 25% hybrids in the ultra earlies, yeah. how they would perform? Yes. Exactly. That's a good question. We have not done that. I, I think it warrants attention. I think that warrants an I'd have to go back and reassess. We'd have to go back and reassess the data. I think we'd find uh, maybe a more promising comparison if we did that, because I think we did we did have some ultra early hybrids, especially those in the 96 to 100 day range that were certainly very competitive uh, with our some of our short season corns and our uh, the the commonly grown maturity hybrids we selected. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, we, we need. We'll go back and take a look at that. That's a good question. What about planting ultra early corn in late April or early May? Well, actually, that would be the, the if from a cover crop standpoint, that would be preferable because what you're looking for, if you could get these uh, from a cover crop standpoint, if you could get these ultra early hybrids established as early as possible, and, you know, when it's appropriate, you don't want to have to go back and replant. But if you could get these ultra early hybrids established very early, I'm, I suspect that. Some of these hybrids you could take off and, and probably the latter half of September very easily, maybe by mid-September, you could take some of these cover, uh, these ultra early hybrids off, harvest them. Again, they might be around 25 to 30%, but you could certainly harvest them then. And that would, 
certainly that would go a long way in, in improving your cover crop establishment. Um, okay, now there's a question about short stature corns. Um, with high populations, narrow rows, less than seven um, feet in height. Would this work in tandem with ultra early corns? Um, I've heard me hearing about these short season corns. You know, I think there's one company that's actually started marketing these very short season. I'm, I'm not sure if we're talking about the same type of short season corns, like these dwarf corns that are, are being introduced. Um, um, I'm not sure if the, the person who asked that could write more information, but. I think that they would offer, you might be able to, this is getting beyond the scope of the study and it's a lot of speculation, but if you, if you could identify a short season corn that had these characteristics and again, kind of following up on the last question, you got it established early and you could grow one of these sh uh, short season dwarf corns uh, down the road, uh, because it's going to be, I, if, if we're thinking, we're talking about the same types of corns, I think they could, they could help as far as the yield deficit. And of course, you're going to be using those same practices probably for the commonly grown maturity hybrids too, but they would be a way to uh, maybe minimize some of your yield losses. You might be able to increase your yield potential using these short season corns with those short season corn with those characteristics, but that's speculation. But it's somewhere where we're headed down the road. I think there's going to be there's. You're, I think we're going to hear a lot more about shorter shorter corns, of course, used in conjunction with higher populations and narrow rows because they lend themselves to that uh, those practices in the future. Um, we have a couple questions about geographical differences. So um, the first question: Would the Worcester and Bucyrus test results be different than Northwest Ohio? They could be, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a good basis for that. They may be one reason the seed companies and seed companies have a, a wealth of information. Their corn breeders are, they have tremendous databases, and there's a, there's probably a good reason why over the years, when we have seen ultra early corns, uh, they're more often in the northeast, north central, northeast part of the state uh, in our entries in our test locations there than than in northwest Ohio. We have locations up there at Upper Sandusky, Van Wert, and Whiteville. And I have, a, I suspect that there are some environmental differences that maybe um, the ultra early corns, it may simply be that the weather, the heat unit availability uh, is greater in those locations than it is in some of the Northwest locations. And that may be another reason why we're, why there's more interest in using the ultra early corns and then our corn hybrids with shorter seasons in the North, in the Northeast, North Central region than in the Northwest. All right, thank you. I'm gonna take, this will be the last question for Peter. Um, in regards to most southern tier of counties in Ohio, has late June planting following cereal grain harvest been studied? It hasn't been studied to my knowledge. I know sometimes people are taking off a, you know, barley or, or a, a forage crop in the in the spring. We'll come back and plant a corn late. Um, and I think that there's, again, this is something that has, I think some of our growers are already uh, are already using this practice and they have probably worked it out, but from a, from a, I don't think we've looked at it methodically. So I think that's another area that warrants attention. We certainly can, you know, there's places, if you go down to uh, the South, sometimes they actually get, get two corn crops in in a year, they've got enough GDDs to do that. But in our area where we, we don't do that typically, but certainly um, I think that's a, a practice that you could use. You could, you could use your commonly grown maturities easily and plant after yeah, uh, your cereal. If you're if you're taking the cereal crop off for forage, you certainly could do that. Uh, when you're using another, when you're taking it off for grain, it's a different story, of course. With when you're getting into July, as far as corn is concerned, if that, if I understood the question right. I think so. Uh, we were very surprised. I think a lot of us, you know, what will happen is we're going to forget this information probably in the near future, but. I was really amazed at how well our corn crop did in 2019. A lot of this corn in Northwest Ohio was planted well into late June. We had some corn that was planted June 26th and it actually reached, it came very, some of these commonly grown maturities that were 111, 110 day hybrids. They, they got frosted in some places, but many of them, we didn't have a hard frost and some of those hybrids squeaked through. They were very high moisture content, but they actually reached maturity and produced some decent yields, but they stayed out in the field a while because they were very wet. 
Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Really appreciate your time this morning and sharing your um, willingness to share with us. And um, looking forward to the next time we can have one.